everything hinges upon verse number 1 and verse number 12 of Psalm 116. David writes, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord, and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low, and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in, all the land, in the land of the living. I believe, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in mine haste, in my haste, all men are liars. What shall I render? under the Lord for all his benefits toward me. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I am thy servant. I am thy servant and the son of thine handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord Lord's house, in the midst of them, or in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem. Praise ye the Lord. You may be seated. I think that we could expound a lot. <laughs> we could extrapolate a lot from Psalm 116, and sometimes the difficulty for a preacher comes in kind of narrowing things down in order for it to just be a concise, curt message that we can take with us and just meditate upon. And honestly, what the Psalms do for me is the Psalms are very therapeutic. <laughs> the Psalms for me, you can go and, and, and maybe it's just one portion or maybe it's just one verse. That's why I said the first, to me, the first and the twelfth verse really spoke out to me. Really spoke out to me. In the first verse, David makes a blunt assertion regarding his own feelings toward God. Notice what he says there. I love the Lord. I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. He makes that bold assertion that he loves the Lord. And what is the proof of his statement? Here, What proves that he loves the Lord? Well, following what he says there in that statement, there's a comma there, because he hath heard my voice and my supplication. And then on and on we see more credit uh, to that assertion, um, or more proof to that assertion. And the whole reason he loves the Lord. And he gives credit first to God for loving him first. For God for showing an interest in him. And this, as we know, is another one of those indicative imperative paradigms. Remember we've talked about that before, the indicatives and the imperatives? Uh, this is the indicative imperative paradigm, which means we see in one passage God initiating and man responding. We see the indicatives, that is God offering a command, or God issuing a decree, or God doing a work, or God uh, uh, working in the life of somebody, and the imperative is the response. And so the reason we say indicative and, and imperative, just so we understand, is the blessings are indicative of something that God's done, right? It's indicative, it indicates a work that God has done. And the imperatives, the imperatives are, it's imperative that these things are seen in us, which means that if God does something, this is how you will respond. And this is imperative evidence that God has really done something. So does that make sense? Uh, indicative indicates what God has done. It's imperative that we respond. Otherwise, something's missing in this whole paradigm. Okay, so we see another indicative and, and imperative model here. God commands, directs, man obeys, and, and man follows. And David loves the Lord, and the Lord loves David. We see that throughout this psalm. Uh, it goes on to offer proof evidenced by both parties of this mutual love. And I ask you tonight, how often have we made the statement, I love the Lord? 
Yet what fruit is there in our life that proves this to be true? What proof is there in our lives that prove this to be true? All of us can say, well, I love the Lord. I love the Lord with all my heart. And that's one of those things that, and you know me, I've said this often, one of those things we need to be careful with how we say. We need to be careful how we frame words. If, if we say, although we are commanded to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and mind, who would be so bold to say that we actually do? Who would be so bold to say, man, I love the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and then go throughout our lives and find those areas of disobedience, those areas of rebellion, those areas of walking in the flesh and not in the spirit, Understand that God commands that of us because He desires perfection. And so to say, I love the Lord, there needs to be evidence in our lives that we do. And David offers that evidence. He loves the Lord because the Lord's done things in his life. The Lord initiated the relationship in the first place. The Bible says we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. And one of the ways that we show that we love the Lord is through our gratitude, through our thanksgiving. And we see that throughout the course, throughout the veins of this psalm. So let's look at four indicatives and then seven imperatives. And I know that's a lot, uh, but we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on them. We're just going to go through the scripture and make a few statements. Number one, the first indicative that God loves His own. Verse number two. He says, Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. Because I love the Lord because he has inclined his ear unto me. Now, this is an indicative of what God's done. Uh, what this says is that God, ha God is showing attention to his children. God's attention toward His children is reason for us to be thankful, is reason for us to love Him. You think about this holy, perfect, immutable, righteous, uh, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent God who is the very essence of love in His being, who is wisdom, who is holy. And, and you think about this cr fallen creation, these fallen men here on the earth that for a season of their life His children live in rebellion. Paul says and such were some of you, even as children of wrath and disobedience. And so even as we walk in disobedience, even as we wear this flesh, this sin-cursed flesh, God still gives attention to His people. This shows His love. I love Him. Why? Well, because He's inclined His ear unto me. It means that God is willing to listen, that God is paying attention to you. Our God is no God who rolled up the ball of the earth and then rolled it down the hill and stepped away from it and said, whatever will be, will be. I'm done with him, although he could have after Adam fell. He could have after, after 6,000 years of sin said, I'm done with the whole human race. They've all gone aside. They're together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. Yet he didn't. He's paid attention to us. And if you're saved here today, He's paid special attention to you. He has lent His ear to you. He has lent His face to you. I thank God that God's attention is toward me. I thank God that if I lift up my voice to Him, He'll hear me. Verse number 3. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. We see another indicative of his love in his salvation, in his attention, and in his salvation. Notice what David says. He says, The sorrows of death compassed me, the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. This is a commentary on the human condition. We are spiritually dead, right? Life is, is because of the, the curse of sin. There's nothing but pain and there's nothing but affliction in this life. Yes, we may experience some seasons of temporal joy, but in the end, death is all around us because one day we're going to close our eyes and open them in eternity. And without God's deliverance, we would all open them in the flames of hell, much like the rich man. And so... The sorrows of death come past me. And, and you think you apply that to your life. You apply that to, to the lost condition. It was all around. Man, you're just, you're just one footstep away or one heartbeat away from hell. It's right there. 
But God reached down and through the precious blood of His Son Jesus Christ made atonement for the sins of His people. And now death is no longer around you. Oh, you will suffer the physical death, but hey, what's, what's that when it comes to eternity? Death has no dominion over you. Death has no uh, authority over you because Jesus Christ died and rose again to pronounce His authority over death and to conquer it. And so I know that the Lord loves me because He's given me His, at uh, His attention and He's given me His salvation. Also, verse number 7, He doesn't stop there. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. Now notice he says soul, that immaterial eternal being. The Lord dealt bountifully with him. Number three, God's abundant blessings for his children. God's abundant blessings for his children. I know the Lord loves me because of the blessings in my life. And I'm not just talking about the physical ones. And in fact, I, and I do thank God. You ought to thank God for all of them, the physical ones, the tangible ones, but also the intangible ones. The things that I can't see with physical sight, the things that I can't feel with my physical fingers, but the things that I know and I affirm to be true because God's done a work in my heart and in my life. And I know that not only do I have a spiritual incorruptible inheritance one day laid up for me in an incorruptible heaven, but I can experience spiritual blessing now. The wisdom that God can give us, the, 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 the spiritual heart He can give us, the, the, His Word that He provides. What bountiful blessings. God didn't have to give us this Word to know Him and to know Him more. But God has revealed in these 66 uh, books of Scripture Himself to us. And, and that's a blessing. To know Him more and more. To never get enough of Him. I know He loves me because He wants me to know about Him. And He wants me to draw closer to Him. He deals bountifully with us. You know, even in desperate times, even in difficult situations that you're tempted to look at and say, Lord, you're not being very good to me. Oh, how short-sighted we are. Because even the pain that we go through, and you think of the Durrance family at this time, even the pain and the difficulty and the uncertainty and the, the, the stress and the anxiety and the trauma, but knowing that, that God is growing their faith, even though Brother Wayman's retired and Sister Jean's retired and they're enjoying that life and, 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 and they're very mature, He's still growing us. He's still teaching us. He's still leading us. And that's a blessing to know that even through pain. God is providing blessing. It takes spiritual insight to see that, but with God's help we can. And so that's, that, that needs to be a prayer of ours. And, and really, I've found that in my life. That needs to be a, a more frequent prayer of mine. That the Lord would reveal these things to me. That the Lord would show these things to me. Because oftentimes, I walk through the veil of flesh, and I see through the veil of flesh. And sometimes you, you may look through the carnal eyes and think, God's not been very good to me lately. We know that to be untrue. Sometimes God has to knock some sense in us to, to remind us of the fallacy of our opinion. God's blessings for His children proves His love. Verse number 16. O oh Lord, I am truly, truly I am Thy servant. I am Thy servant and the son of Thine handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. God's liberty bestowed upon His children. God's liberty bestowed upon His children. You have spiritual liberty. What does the spiritual liberty mean? When He talks about the bondage of sin and, and those sorts of things, what, what does that mean? That means that sin does not have power over you. And I would that more Christians, and myself included, we would recognize this on a daily basis. Sin has no power over us. Yet we succumb to it. Why? Well, we forget that truth so often. And again, we see through the veil of flesh. And we, well, I can't conquer this sin. Or I can't get victory over it. Or I'm going to succumb to it. You don't have to. He has freed us from the power of sin. Now, yes, the presence of sin will be here until we are glorified. But sin has, hath no more dominion over you, the Word of God says. I know God loves me because He freed me from that enslaving power of sin. So those are the indicatives. 
Those are reasons to be thankful and reasons to love Him. Because He's given us His ear. He's shown us attention. He's given us salvation. He provides abundant blessings. He's given us spiritual liberty. Now the imperatives, or how we show our thanksgiving for those four primary graces of God. And again, it's not alone in saying, I'm thankful. I almost asked you tonight to just go around the horn and say, what are you thankful for? But that's awful cliche, and I, I didn't want to preach this after I did that, because then you might feel bad. <laughs> because we can all say we're thankful for certain things, but God surely knows our hearts. God knows if we're truly thankful and by works is our, made, our, our faith made manifest. And by our works, the level of our gratitude is proved. Now, by our works, we're not saved. We know that. We're saved by grace alone, through faith. But faith without works is dead, as James writes. Which means, simply just means this. It means that your works prove whether or not you have faith. You can't say, I have faith and then have no works, because then that's a dead faith, right? And so our works prove our faith, and, and I hold wholeheartedly affirm the truth also that our, our works affirm our gratitude, affirm our thanksgiving, our love. Number one, I'll go through quicker, quickly with these. Verse number one, he says, I love the Lord. So number one, we show our thanksgiving by giving our love to Him. If we're truly thankful, we will devote our love to Him. And when I say we will devote our love, that means He is number one in our heart. He is number one in our heart. And nothing, no idol, no family member, we often make idols out of even spouses. Nothing usurps His authority or His place in our heart. And, and typically that is the, the first step downward. That's what happened with Ephesus, right? They left their first love. Their first love and what happens? Well, they fell into apostasy. They fell into sin. And that's always the first step to sin when something else takes the place of God in our heart. Because if we truly love Him and He's number one, we're not going to want to do anything that's going to disrupt that relationship. Not that it's going to cause the, the cords of salvation to sever, but that it can, it can hinder our relationship and it can hinder our walk. And so the first thing you show the Lord that you're thankful is your love. Number two. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. And the sense here means that I will depend upon him. I will rely upon him. I will call upon him in need, in times of need. That's what the sense of the, the, the writer is getting at there. And so, number two, we show our level of gratitude by our dependence and our expectation upon him. And I had to link those two together, dependence and expectation. Because when you truly depend, it shows that you have great expectation, right? Because when you really rely upon one, you know that that one's going to come through. If you have doubt that they're going to come through, then you're really not relying wholeheartedly on them. Have you ever done that? Have you ever, ever made plans and then you've got backup plans because the person with whom you made plans has a habit of breaking those plans? That's typically me, so don't depend on me too much. But we know that we can depend on, upon the Lord 100% of the time because we have great expectation, right? We know He'll follow through. We know no matter what the situation... And I know Wayman and Gene, I'm using you a lot today because we're just thankful that Landon's doing better. But I know for a fact that by their heart and the things that they've said and the prayers that they've pray, prayed, that they had expectation. That there is a dependence upon God. Number seven... Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. We have confidence in Him. Return unto thy rest, O my soul. There's nothing like having peace and rest in life. There's nothing like it. I preached the message and um, I'm, I'm, I'm praying about re-preaching it here. I preached a message a long time ago called Peace, Why the Comfort is Better Than the Cure. And just simply the, the, the idea behind it, and it's out of Philippians, is, is the idea behind it or the truth that the Lord showed me behind it is that sometimes we look at peace as the cure to our problems. Lord, I'll be at peace once my problems go away. 
But that's not what peace is. Peace is comfort in the problems. And why the comfort is better than the cure is because the comfort teaches us to have rest in Christ and to have confidence in Him in spite of our surroundings. That if we had no problems, we would never have. And so our prayer shouldn't be, Lord, take all of these problems away because you're really not putting your confidence any longer in Him. And so the comfort He can provide does a lot more for us than the cure would. And I know that one way that we show that we're grateful is by us finding rest and confidence in Him in spite of our circumstances. Going to Him knowing, Lord, you're going to follow through for me and I've got peace. Number, number four, verse number nine. I will walk, I like this, before the Lord in the land of the living. I will walk before the Lord. We show our thankfulness to Him when we walk with Him. Now, David's walk in life was before the Lord. He says that in the land of the living. That is, he understood that his life was lived for God and God alone. And it was the pleasure of the Lord that he sought before any man. To say, I will walk before Him, it means that I'm walking in the presence of God. That I'm walking, I'm living this life for Him. I'm not living this life before Roger Reiner. I'm not being a man pleaser. I'm not living this life for, before self. I'm living my life before God and I'm going to walk before Him. Him, which means that if you commit to walk before Him, to walk in His presence, think about that for a moment. If you say, I'm going to walk before the Lord in life, that means that you're saying, Lord, I want your face to shine upon me. I want you to see me. I want to be out in the open with you. I don't want any secret sin that's hindering my fellowship with you. I don't want to be as Adam, and I don't want to find some fig leaves and find a bush to hide behind, but I want to be out in the open walking before you as long as I live. I'm not walking before men in this land of the living. I'm walking before God. And that's a great way to show God that you're appreciative and you're thankful to know, Lord, I'm going to walk for you. I'm going to live for you. And everything I do is going to be according to your pleasure and according to your will. Verse number 10. He says, I believed, therefore have I spoken. And I was greatly afflicted. Number five, we show that we love Him and are thankful when we declare Him. Now, the sense of this verse is that persecution ensued due to, due to David's testimony of faith. And that's, that's the sense here of, of Scripture. And oftentimes... How often are we silenced? We, we, we uh, heard a message Sunday night. The missionary brought the message and he talked about what are you ashamed of? Right? And, and oftentimes, one of the reasons we don't speak up and declare the name of the Lord is because of fear. Because of fear of persecution. Because of fear of being called a name or something like that. Right? Let's be honest. Amen. But listen, we show Him we're thankful for Him, for him and, and everything that He's done for us when we declare Him. When we're not afraid to declare Him in our generation. To speak for Him, to speak up for Him. Not that He needs us to defend Him <laughs> at all. But how often do we go through life and, and we cower to the world? Verse number 13. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will take the cup of salvation. We feed and drink from Him. We partake of His nature. Jesus Christ is the bread of life, right? He is the living water. Those, that, that, those metaphors that He uses are for us to see that we are to go to Him daily and feed from Him and drink from Him. That is to learn of Him. That is to be satisfied with Him, right? I drink from the Lord. That means I'll never thirst again. That means that there is no water in this world that could ever compare to the satisfaction that I can receive with Christ Jesus my Lord. That is going to Him every day. Going to His cross. Going to His Word. And growing and finding satisfaction. What do you find satisfaction in? In this life. If you're finding supreme satisfaction in something other than Christ, it's not truly satisfying. 
And it's not showing the Lord that you're committed and that you love Him. And then finally, verses number 17 through, 8, through 19. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I'll pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all His people in the courts of the Lord's house. In the midst of thee, O Jerusalem, praise ye the Lord. We will offer unto Him. We will offer unto Him. We will offer our praise. We will offer our thanksgiving. We will be committed. I'll pay my vows. That means I'm just going to be dedicated to you. What do you offer unto the Lord? You know, He owns you, right? He owns you. He's not a taskmaster, no. But you've been bought and paid for by Christ's blood if you're His child. What do you offer unto Him? Like I said, verse number 12 is the central key verse here. He says, What shall I render unto the Lord for all His benefits toward me? You've seen all of His benefits in this psalm, and there's more that we could list probably. You've seen what David can render unto him, or desires to render unto him. Now apply that verse, number 12, to yourself. If you truly believe in those indicatives, what are you showing in return? What are you rendering unto Him? And that's a good question I think we all ought to ask ourselves. And when we go through our life and, and we use this as a template, we, we use what David writes here as a template, and I think we should, we can probably start crossing out some of those. Well, I'm not offering that. I'm not declaring Him. I'm not walking with Him. You see why the Word of God is so beneficial for us? Because it shows us a pattern. It shows us a template that we ought to use to mold ourselves to. I'll tell you, some of these are very convicting to me. What am I rendering unto the Lord? I say I'm thankful. We're going to celebrate Thanksgiving. And I'm going to tell my kids that I'm thankful for them and I'm thankful for all of God's blessings in my life. But how do I show it? What am I really giving God? Does God want our words? Does God want us to be like the Jews who draw nigh unto Him with our lips, but our hearts are far from Him? Is that what God wants? What are we actually rendering unto Him? Good question. Only you and God can answer that. Perhaps only God can truly answer that because He knows your heart better than you do. But may we strive. May we strive. The indicatives are His part. The imperatives are ours. Father, we thank You.